being outlined, well, I'm going to go with profit as the motive, terrified me, I suppose, <laughs> is that it was pretty damn obvious that she's been aiming at the presidency for 50 years. Increase involvement and engagement in our democracy to get more people to pay attention. Who exactly are you talking about here? Right. Are you talking about the elites that are in control? Are you talking about the whole damn population? For how long? And, and, to, and as you already pointed out, to what end? To what end? So to exactly. what end? To what end is all this? And exactly. well, we, we, we touched on that a little bit. You can't, you can't help but, and this is where I suppose I turn into a leftist in some real sense, um, at least in relationship to what you might describe as a stance against gigantism. It's like, to what end? Well, how about um, military industrial profits that are staggering? How about that end? And if there's no other end in sight, and I'm not particularly skeptical about capitalism, except in its gigantism forms, it's like if there's no other end being outlined, well, I'm going to go with profit as the motive, because if you have a better theory, man, lay it out, but I don't see anything. And, you know, given, given, given that it was Eisenhower who, who knew what he was talking about when he warned about the military-industrial complex being the biggest threat we faced back in, what, about 1959. Mm -hmm. That was something to take seriously, and it's something to take seriously again. Two questions on the Hillary front. I mean, one of the reasons she terrified me, I suppose, <laughs> is that it was pretty damn obvious that she's been aiming at the presidency for 50 years. Sure. And that's a long time. Right, and you got to ask yourself, what is driving someone who's that committed to that goal? Like, and the goal is clearly the presidency. It's not what could be done with the presidency. And it's not like she was dragged in kicking and screaming by people who were overwhelmingly impressed by her prowess and who, you know, enjoined upon her for moral reasons to consider a career in government. It's like, no, 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 she's being laser focused on being the first female president of the United States for God only knows how long. And so that that's concerning to me. But then but then that doesn't answer the next or address the next mystery, which is, well, given that she's a Democrat and given that the Democrats should, in principle, be somewhat skeptical, let's say, of the a fascist collusion between corporation and government and a little bit skeptical on the military industrial side. Why, if you're not on the front line, because <laughs> your bank account is not useful to you when you're dead. But yes. if you're, if someone else is dead and the consequence of that is that your bank account is accruing profits quite nicely, well, you know, that's, that's all well and good, especially if you're a psychopathic narcissist and it's all about you. And that's right. And so. And there's no shortage of that going around at the highest echelons of, of what would you call it, fascist collusion. And we're seeing that pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So, okay, so let's turn to the Republicans. We've, okay. We've, 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 we've had our shot at the warmongering Democrats, let's say. Um, what tends to happen is you get pulled in one stupid step at a time, especially if if you're also turning a blind eye to the chic chicanery of your wealthy friends who are profiting like mad on the war front. And so yes. people always, I think they said, you know, when World War I started, it was like, the troops will be home for Christmas. It's like, <laughs> yeah, guess that didn't happen. And then it's many, many years later, and it's not like that didn't happen in Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan. Exactly. Like, this will be over soon. It's like, yes. yeah, I don't think so. On what grounds do you base your claim that spending more money than the Democrats feeding this god-awful legacy media machine is, well, it's not effective and it's counterproductive and they hate you. So what are you doing? And and so then what happens in Washington, it's very similar, is the, the parties devolve to the simplistic notion that those junior congressmen who can beat the drum most effectively to raise money are ipso facto the most loyal and competent. And that's all based on a whole misapprehension of it's a measurement problem. It's like the money you raise is not an indication of your competence. It's the same problem we were talking about with relationship to women in the military to begin with. I think it's especially true on the Democrat side, but it's also true on the Republican side. They're facing constant pressure from the powers that be who are very entrenched to do nothing but raise money for the damn yes. party, even though they waste almost all of that, and to toe the bloody party line. And of course, yes. you have to have a certain amount of party discipline or you don't have a party. You know, my experience with organizations 
and activists for that matter, is that the they turns out to be a very small number of people who are yes. very well connected, who are continually maneuvering. And yes. sometimes that's a consequence of their unbelievable competence. And sometimes it's a consequence of their unbelievable capacity to manipulate and and uh, capitalize on narcissism. And that's a, probably a problem in politics and entertainment and media more than anywhere else for obvious reasons. Um, and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush because that's sure. That's foolish. But the they that are looking at you and thinking, well, you know, we can certainly look use someone with an image like hers for us. And that's not all cynical, by the way. Um, who who are the who are the people who are making those decisions as far as you're concerned? If we go back, say, well, when you were asked to serve as vice chairman, who are making those who is making those decisions? Well, I mean, obviously Nancy Pelosi is one of them. Uh, you know, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was the, the head of the, the DNC at the time. Uh, there were people in the Obama administration. Uh, there are people who, uh, were not elected officials and, and within the DNC, I'm sure there were probably political donors as well who had a part, a mm-hmm. part of that. But, but, you know, we'll, we'll start with Nancy Pelosi. I had won my primary election here in Hawaii, uh, in August of 2012. And um, that in Hawaii, Hawaii is a very strong democratic state. That was essentially the election. I did have a Republican opponent and still had to go and win the general election. But uh, it was a safe assumption that I was going to, I I had de facto already won uh, the election. And within a few weeks of winning that election, I had uh, gotten a call from Nancy Pelosi saying, would you like to come and speak during prime time at the Democratic National Convention? That was going to happen. Uh, shortly, shortly after that, this was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, in 2012. Someone who had not even yet been elected to Congress for the first time being invited to speak in prime shocking. time. It was. I was surprised. Yeah, I was very I surprised. Uh, the topic she was asking me to talk about is one that is obviously near and dear to my heart to talk about veterans, and uh, and so I said yes, of course, I will do that. I went there and I spoke and I did interviews with just about every media channel that was out there. And but my yeah. decision, my decision uh, to leave as vice chair of the DNC was one of those pivotal moments where, in the lead up to that 2016 primary election, I started to see very quickly that the decisions that were being made, not in consultation with us as vice chairs of the DNC, but unilaterally by Debbie, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was the chair who was very close with Hillary Clinton, were made to give an advantage to Hillary Clinton. For example, limiting the number of debates where she would have to face Bernie Sanders. Uh, Putting them at times where, you know, I think there was one that was scheduled during like the Super Bowl or something like that when nobody was going to be watching or paying attention to Mm -hmm. a presidential uh, debate. There were there were uh, con- new newly implemented rules that said any Democratic presidential candidate that participates in a debate that is not sanctioned by the DNC will be banned from participating in any future DNC debate. And and for mm. me, I'm just thinking like, if our if our purpose and our cause is to increase involvement and engagement in our democracy to get more people to pay attention to learn more about these different candidates to actually have a real dialogue about these important issues why would you be punishing someone for going out and trying to engage in doing exactly that why would you be trying to limit the debate that the american people can be exposed to and involved with and it was very clear uh, why those decisions were made to give an advantage to hillary clinton who was designated as the one that the democratic party powers that be wanted to win that election. And so their lack of integrity, uh, coupled with the fact that Hillary Clinton wanted to be our commander in chief. 